Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. This is a bi-weekly show in which we talk about the solo careers of the Beatles by far and away the most successful solo careers of any individual artist coming from a previous band. It's a celebration of that. And uh, I am Ken Michaels. I'm one of the four regular co-hosts of this show. Hopefully you know me for some other Beatle programs that I do. One is a syndicated Beatle show currently on almost 40 radio stations called Every Little Thing. I also am the co-host of another Beatles podcast called Things We Said Today. And I'm being joined by my three other regular co-hosts. Let's uh, bring them on right now. First of all, she is the queen of Beatles social media. Really and truly, she's the queen of everything. You know, I mean, you know the song Elizabeth Reigns? <laughs> uh-uh. Kit Reigns. <laughs> and uh, she is the author of Songs Who Are Singing, <laughs> Guided Tours, to the Beatles' Lesser Known Songs. Also, Michael Jackson, FAQ, All That's Left to Know About the King of Pop. And she also is a contributing writer to Beatle Fan. And she does a Deep Tracks column. Um, does a lot of writing on the Beatles and soul music, too. Let's welcome Kit O'Toole. Hi, Kit. Hi, Ken. You do the best introductions. <laughs> <laughs> hi, Joe. Hi, Tom. And hi, oh. everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. Not as good as your press to play introduction, though, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm still working to beat that one. There you go. <laughs> also, we have a man who's been uh, a sensation on YouTube for the past eight years. He covers Beatles. There's a lot of reviews on Beatles stuff and all things in the entertainment world. And he's been a welcome addition to our show now for quite some time. He's me, Mr. <laughs> Mayo. We know him as Joe. And for some reason, he's holding up Ringo, and I don't know why. <laughs> I don't <can't> imagine why. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Ken. Hi, how you doing? And uh, hello to Tom over there. And hi, Kit. How are you? Hello, hello. Doing great. Good to see Good. you, Joe. Thanks. Also, we have one of the co-hosts of the Paul McCartney, the solo Paul McCartney podcast called Two Legs, along with Andy Nichols. And it's a great show, getting better and better all the thank time. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, can't get no own... worse. I wasn't going to say that. I, wasn't gonna say that. <laughs> I deliberately set you up for these things. Yeah, so, <laughs> just go with the flow. All right. And uh, we welcome Tom Hunyadi. Hi, Tom. Hello, Ken. Thank you very much for that. And uh, Mayo and Kit, it's good to see you guys once again. Hey. On today's show, on today's show, we're going to be covering the very first solo album from Ringo Starr which uh, just recently celebrated its 50th anniversary. <clears throat> it's an album of all standards, pre-rock and roll standards, called Sentimental Journey. Joe is holding up the vinyl right there. <laughs> and we'll be talking about uh, our thoughts about that album 50 years later, um, um, what we think about that album now. And we'll share our thoughts about that. Get you guys watching and listening your opinions, too. Uh, but first of all, we got a lot of Beatle news to get to. By the way, I just want to mention, thanks to all of you who watched us on the virtual uh, Fest for Beatle fans uh, mm. show that we did. We did a, a panel. We also brought back Ken Womack, which was a blast. We had the five of us together talking about our favorite solo Beatle songs on each Beatle. We each picked a Beatle, and Ken had wings as a separate thing. It was great. In that particular show, we were told to keep it to 45 minutes, so we had to eliminate news in that show. I know some people look forward to, to the news. In our last show on Press to Play, uh, we had trouble uploading it to YouTube, and we had to take out the news. So we apologize for that. But we're going to load you up with a lot of news from the last couple of weeks. <laughs> Get <Okay>. loaded! <laughs> First of all, news that broke today. I hope you all heard about this. Global Citizen and World Health Organization have announced a live streaming concert event called One World Together at Home, which will include performances from Paul McCartney, Stevie Wonder, Elton John, Lady Gaga, Billie Eilish, Chris Martin, Billy Joe, Billy Joe Armstrong, Lizzo, and others. Lady Gaga has actually curated the event, which is being done to raise money for personal protective equipment. You always hear PPE. That's what it stands for, for the coronavirus. Um, the concert will be broadcast live on April 18th at 8 p.m. Eastern, and that will be on ABC, NBC, Viacom, CBS Networks, and iHeartMedia. Jimmy Fallon, Jimmy Kimmel, and Stephen Colbert 
will be hosting the event. So we're looking forward to that. Don't know how much Paul will do. Curious to find out what song or songs he will perform for this event. Mm. But uh, again, that's on April the 18th. A couple weeks back, we heard of something that just started called the Inner Light Challenge. And the Material World Foundation started by George Harrison in 1973, the best year ever in the history of the Beatles, <laughs> announced that they are donating $500,000 to the Music Cares COVID-19 Relief Fund, Save the Children and Doctors Without Borders, uh, those charities which are providing much-needed aid and care during the COVID-19 pandemic. You can join the Inner Light Challenge by sharing a verse, chorus, or a line from the Beatles song and posting it with the hashtag uh, Inner Light 2020 to help raise an additional $100,000 to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, Danny Harrison posted a video with him singing the song a cappella in the lotus position, which is very <laughs> nice. And on March the 31st, Anusha, uh, Anusha Shunkar has uh, also posted a video of her playing the sitar <coughs> to the Inner Light. If you okay. haven't seen Danny's version, I haven't it, seen it yet. Oh, oh. it's incredible. Um, mm. it, it's it's and in fact, I mean, it's it's spooky. Um, <laughs> it because, sounds so yeah. much like his father. It looks like his father. It's it's just uh, and as as Ken said, it's a cappella. It's beautiful. You have to see it. Yeah, and the Harrisons are actually going to donate. A dollar for every post that is shared to charities. They're hoping to raise an additional hundred thousand mm. dollars for this. Ringo himself posted online regarding the health crisis right now. Let's be careful and responsible. Everything will get better. Peace and love. And I'm sure you know this, but just in case there are some that don't know, Ringo Starr announced that his upcoming North American tour has been canceled. Due to the coronavirus, Ringo was quoted as saying, this is a very difficult time for me. In 30 years, I think I've only missed two or three gigs, never mind a whole tour. But this is how things are for all of us now. I have to stay in just like you have to stay in. And we all know it's the peace and loving thing we do for each other. So we have moved the spring tour to, to uh, 2021. My fans know I love them, and I love to play for them, and I can't wait to see you all as soon as possible. In the meantime, stay safe. Peace and love to you all. I have heard that um, the dates for next year are going to be very close in time to the way that they are right now. It may not be exact, but it's going to be in that vicinity. Okay? So as soon as we hear more, we'll let you know. And I kept my uh, tickets I, you know, somebody said, "Why don't you get a refund?" I said, "Nope. Well, for now, I'll keep them. See how we do a year, a, over a year from now, yeah. uh, so we can go." Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully they'll honor them, but you can also check with the venue. I would. Yeah, hope. I don't see why they wouldn't honor them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they said they were going. They just switched the dates, as far as I yeah. understand it. I think they right. honor them. Right. Okay. Also, Paul's European dates were postponed. I've heard that already bought tickets remain valid for that. Um, replacement dates are currently being searched for, and this process will likely take some time, and they'll probably push the tour back to 2021. The Glastonbury Festival as well uh, was canceled, and they were due to celebrate their 50th anniversary on June 27th with Paul as the headlining act. We also know that the uh, Fest for Beatle fans was postponed. It now will be October 9th, 10th, and 11th at the same location. Uh, which is the Hyatt Regency jersey on the Hudson. We did have the virtual fest for Beatle fans, like I mentioned before. What a brilliant idea. Yeah. I think just about all of the events from that weekend took place online, and you just had to go to the fest's own uh, Facebook page for that. There was one for the virtual fest for Beatle fans, and you had to uh, just bring up the Facebook page at the right time, and you could see so many things. Lots of concerts, Lawrence Juber, did a concert. Scott Erickson did a couple of concerts. Really nice. One on just Paul Solo. One Beatles. Um, interviews were streamed live. Tom Franjone interviewed Peter Asher. Um, Ken Dashow from Q104 interviewed Billy J. Kramer. And um, Don Daneman from The Circle. He was involved there. Greg Bissonette from Ringo and the All-Stars. He was interviewed. So I believe 
all that stuff or most of that stuff should still be on the Facebook page. Mm -hmm. uh, if you so, don't mind one second, Ken, uh, speaking of LJ, he did a kick-ass version of 20 Flight Rock today for his tea time with LJ today. It was great. Cool. Yeah. yeah, that's true. For what Tom, If you don't know what Tom's referring to, every single day, including the weekends, at 1.30 Pacific Time, 4.30 Eastern Time, Lawrence Juber does a mini concert from his home studio. He takes out his acoustic guitar. He does two or three numbers. You go to his face, uh, Facebook page. You can hear the whole thing. It's a joy. You know, he's yeah, such a great sure guitar is. player. Sometimes Amazing. he does Beatles. He's got his new CD out, the Fab Fourth. So sometimes he does Beatles. Sometimes he does Paul. He does his original stuff. But this is an ongoing thing. And, uh, and he leaves it up on Facebook. So if you don't catch it when it is live, you can see it later. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, I'm also told just from watching the Fest's uh, Facebook page tomorrow at 6 p.m. Eastern, there'll be a streaming event uh, celebrating Ravi Shankar's 100th birthday. Hmm. There's also supposed to be a concert held every weekend starting this weekend, April 10th and 11th at 7 p.m. in connection with the Fest, which you can watch on Facebook and Instagram. So you might want to check that out if you're looking for something to do on the weekends. Okay, a couple things. Uh, record store day was moved to uh, June the 20th, and uh, there will be the seven inch uh, Instant Karma new remix for 2020 coming out, as well as the uh, remastered half speed remastered McCartney album. Again, that's on June the 20th. Also, just announced two weeks ago is a new book coming out on October the 8th called John and Yoko Plastic Metal Band. It lists both John and Yoko as authors. It's 288 pages long, includes a preface from Yoko, includes chapters with titles from every song on John's Plastic Metal Band album, plus chapters called Who Are the Plastic Metal Band, Collaboration, Live Performance, Catharsis, and one on the album's artwork. The book is now available for pre-order on Amazon. Uh, both Plastic on uh, Band albums are celebrating their 50th anniversary in December this year. This leads to speculation as to whether or not, with everything else coming out, will there be a Plastic on All Band 50th anniversary box set? Oh. Yeah. So uh, the second half of this year is shaping up to be very eventful as far as archival releases, Flaming Pie, the box set, is due out July 24th. The Beatles film, The Beatles Get Back, in movie theaters on September the 4th. <laughs> I can't see anything. Can, can I we, can't see can the we bottom. Share, can we yeah. share in that, Tom? He's yeah, getting, take uh, it all. Please, take, his, it, take it. Oh, money. Money, he's <laughs> getting his money out. <laughs> Going to have to mortgage the house. Yeah. Um, yeah nobody's working. The audio and video releases for the uh, 50th anniversary for Let It Be. And we did hear the plans are underway for a 50th anniversary release for All Things Must Pass. Let's hope that with this pandemic, you never know, things could get pushed back. But those are the dates that we have for now. Well, uh, with regard to the Get Back movie, I'm so excited about the idea of it premiering and seeing it in a theater Yeah, that I would rather them push it back if if, if things are not well enough then rather than just say oh let's just you know stream it or Stur something stream it. Or do, yeah. I, I i would really I hope we don't miss that opportunity i'm not going to be surprised if they stream it at the same time as the first day that it opens in theaters i think that's what oh. they kind of did with the um with the, the live uh, documentary the ron howard film eight days a week yeah eight days yeah. a week yeah uh -huh. oh i don't mind uh, the same as well but i don't want it to i want there to be an option i'm hoping you know i want to gotcha. see, right. see it in theater well, I'm with you, Joe. There's nothing like seeing it in a movie theater. Absolutely. Even with even with having big screen TVs today, no. you don't get bigger than <laughs> the screen on the movie theater. And then you're also with other fans who are there to celebrate yeah. with you. So an, an appreciative yeah. audience. Yeah. 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 So let's hope those dates stay the same. Yeah. Keep our fingers crossed for that. The Beatles were on the front cover of the app the April edition of the UK magazine record collector, a photo of each of them takes up the front cover with the headline, let them be the Beatles awesome. solo, the alternate story. Okay. Um, also 
Not sure if I mentioned this in the last show, but a new book will be coming out on George Harrison called Be Here Now, which is due out uh, September 29th. It's written by Chris Murray and Barry Feinstein. It'll coincide with the 50th anniversary for George's All Things Must Pass. Bob Dylan has just released a new 17-minute song, which is partly on the assassination of President Kennedy called Murder Most Foul. There are references in the song to the Beatles, as well as The Who and Jerry and the Pacemakers. Hmm. Okay, I have been told. I still haven't heard it yet. It is online. It's only available digitally. It's very trans-like. You get into a trance listening <laughs> yeah, to it. I've heard about melodic. 10 minutes. I played 10 minutes of it. It's 17 minutes, I believe. And uh, it, it's interesting. The lyrics are interesting, I thought. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I didn't finish it, though. <laughs> but uh, what I heard, I, I, I like the lyrics of it more than the you know music. Yeah. It's also supposed to be his first original song. Yeah. But it's old. Time. It's an older song, though. It is right. an older song. Right. Yeah. Hmm. I think okay. 2013, if I'm not mistaken, if I seem to remember him saying that. I just, yeah, it just seems like one of those songs that you have to, you know, set aside time, sit and, and really. Mm-hmm. And know, just listen. listen. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Listen with your headphones. You know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Perfect. Perfect. Let, yep. let your mind focus yeah. on it. Yeah. Exactly. Float downstream. Ah, oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I stifle that. <laughs> Relax. All right. There's also a new tribute song for Paul, which is called Thank You, Paul. And it's by a guy with an unusual name. Yeah. It's Coke, C O K E, Belda, B E L D A. There's lots of titles of Beatles, of uh, Paul songs. Uh, from his solo career, like Another Day, Dear Boy, Dear Friend, Off the Ground, Some Days, Beautiful Night, and Take It Away. And you can check it out on YouTube. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Paul, by Coke Belda. Okay. Now for the part of the show that I'm actually kind of, you know, dreading, and that's to announce the major passings of the last couple of weeks, which we can't ignore. First of all, there's Joe Diffie. Joe uh, was a country music singer and songwriter uh, from the 90s on up. He actually scored five number one singles on Billboard's country music charts, the last of which was a song which was called Bigger Than the Beatles. Hmm. It was released in late 1995. The song tells the story of an amateur rocker and his cocktail waitress girlfriend who see each other as rock stars. And their love for each other is so great that it's described as being bigger than the Beatles. And the title of the song was actually a pun based on John's comments that the Beatles were bigger than Jesus. And the end of the song even has a background chorus reminiscent of She Loves You. Joe Diffie died of complications from the coronavirus, and he was 61. Of course, we know about Adam Schlesinger, singer, songwriter, producer, multi-instrumentalist known for being in the band's Fountains of Wayne, Ivy, and Tinted Windows. He wrote and co-produced the song That Thing You Do, and he was the producer for the last two albums for the Monkees, their big comeback album, Good Times, and Christmas Party. He produced a lot of artists, Fastball, America, Robert Plant. Uh, He also died of the coronavirus, only 52 um, and the Weaklings, we all know who they are, good friends of ours. They just posted a new video as a tribute to Adam in which they cover that thing you do. And they throw a surprise at the end with a little bit of Stacy's mom. Hmm. Very nice there from the Weaklings. Then there's Bill Withers, the great R&B singer and songwriter known for a lot of classic hits like Ain't No Sunshine, Use Me. Lean On Me, Grandma's Hands, Lovely Day and Just the Two of Us, which he sang lead vocals on for Grover Washington Jr. Bill covered Let It Be on his debut album called Just As I Am from 1971. And Paul McCartney and his band covered Ain't No Sunshine for their appearance on MTV's Unplugged. Paul, however, did not sing lead on the song. It was actually Hamish Stewart that sang lead. And Paul moved over and played drums on it, which is very cool to watch. Um, Bill Withers was 81, and I don't know if you saw, but there have been a couple of photos floating around from when Bill yes. was inducted into the Rock and Roll yep. Hall of Fame along with Ringo, and there was one picture of Paul, Ringo, Stevie Wonder, and Bill Withers yep. together 
There's a Fab Four for you. <laughs> yeah, the, that one. That one really hurts <clears throat> me. I, 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 I loved his music. One of the best songwriters. Uh, just a straightforward, powerful, emotional singer. Um, I, I mean, Grandma's Hands is is uh -huh. one of my favorites. I mean, what a storyteller. Just you know, using that that image of, of you know of his grandmother's hands to tell a story about her life and and her love and oh, I mean I right. I'm I'm still I'm I'm that 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 one I'm I'm still feeling that I'm I'm just absolutely crushed. These are all songs that stay with you. I yep. mean, yeah. Lean on me has been covered a lot. You know, mm -hmm. ain't no sunshine. He said a lot in just like. Two minutes. That's right. <laughs> for, exactly. For two and a half minutes in his exactly. song. Exactly. He was straightforward. Yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, Bill Withers, 81 years old. And then yesterday, Honor Blackman died. She starred as Kathy Gale in the TV series for The Avengers and was also in the James Bond classic Goldfinger. She actually recorded A World Without Love. That's mm. the reason oh, why I'm bringing her up on a Beatles show. And that was in 1964 for her album, Everything I've Got. I know that we mentioned uh, Kenny Rogers in our last show, but um, I did find out that George Martin produced an album for him yep. in 1985. It was called The Heart of the Matter. And I did say in our last show, the Press to Play show, I do recall reading that Paul wrote a song for him that Kenny turned down. If anybody knows anything about it, unless Paul gets asked the question, we'll probably never know. But it could have been around that time when George Martin produced Kenny Rogers. All right, so that's all the news that we have for the show this time out. And if I can, uh, add, if I can add just one thing, um, if there's any fans of the uh, 1986 uh, video, because it, I don't think it was available here, it was just shown on BBC One and BBC Two, and that was the uh, the Paul McCartney special uh, from 1986. That is now up on YouTube. If you ever right. missed it, you Sorry. know. So, and one interesting thing that I wish we had it because it was. Um, uh, two weeks prior because it was basically, you know, uh, you know, press to play related as right. well. And for, for Ken's amusement, you know, the interviewer asked him, you know, you, you fought hard to always make sure wings was treated as a band and, and Paul, you know, agreed. And, uh, you know, yeah, he talked about that too. So it, it was really good. This is my first time seeing it. And, um, I, I enjoyed it a lot. I thought it was really well, well, very well done. So it's yeah. up on YouTube now. I know. And I actually watched it couple of days yeah. ago because yeah. it was shared on facebook so mm -hmm. the only thing they block out is paul's performance right for, um right. wildlife princess trust yeah no, for the and princess trust. trust oh yeah, yeah. Uh, do they have him doing the, the the press bit when he's doing press in this in the studio yeah oh yeah 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 that's at the beginning that. that's cool yeah yeah that and they like. show <laughs> some of the press video itself in the subway you know, mm -hmm. cheapest video I've ever done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So anyway, this little yes. lady here is the topic mm, of our is. conversation tonight. This was Ringo Starr's first solo album, despite the fact that Ringo refers to the Ringo album as his first <laughs> solo album. Mm, yeah, it's well. not. We're but, correcting but, you, Ringo. Yeah. <laughs> because, right. uh, the first album he ever released was this one, which actually came out in uh, March, March 27th to be exact, of 1970. It actually peaked in the United States at number 22 on the charts and yep. went top 10 in seven. the UK. Number seven. Yeah, very respectable right there in the UK. Uh, that album was actually recorded over a span of little more than four months, the end of October of 69. Right. Finished up March 6th of 1970. It sold over half a million copies in the US, so it was actually a gold album. Gold. Well, okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting things to say about this album. First of all, it was recorded in a number of studios. Hmm. Um, EMI or Abbey Road Studios, Trident, Wessex Sound, Olympic, Delane Lea, uh, Morgan, and also uh, one of the songs was at A&M in Los Angeles. Um, and uh, I think that was, um, what song was that? Let me see. Love is Many Splendor Thing, I think, was started mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. And um, the other Beatles actually suggested to Ringo to make a solo album. Right. But the whole idea to do this and do all standards really is because his mom loved that music. His stepdad loved that music. He was brought up on that music. 
Let's right. not forget that the Beatles' love for music didn't start with the 50s rock and roll because, right. um, you know, rock and roll didn't really kick in until the mid 50s. Mm -hmm. So Ringo right. was born in 1940. There's like 15 years there. There's all that other music that he was exposed to. He was brought on that stuff too, along with his family, his aunts and uncles. So he wanted to make an album that would please his parents, his mom and his stepdad. And so many of these songs are favorites of his and of the families. So I want to know, here it is 50 years later, a very unusual way to kick off your solo career. I mean, <laughs> you would think that Ringo yeah. would start off by doing a pop rock album. Instead, he well, went in this direction. Um, so let's start with uh, you, Kit. What do you think about this album all these years later? Well, you know, it's, it's so interesting when you know, you read some of the initial reviews in, in Rolling Stone and so forth, but boy, did he get a lot of crap for doing this <laughs> album. I mean, he really did. I mean, in Rolling Stone, they were saying, oh, what's next? He's going to duet, do a duet with Peggy Lee. You know, I mean, he really just just was made great fun of uh, for doing this. And sure, it must have been a shock uh, for people to, as you said, you know, they were probably expecting, oh, you know, this is a Beatle. I mean, he's going to do rock and roll. I mean, uh -huh. but what is he doing, you know, <laughs> doing stardust mm -hmm. and, and, and everything? But, um, you know, and it was interesting because, you know, when we uh, started doing Talk More Talk, I will say Ringo was probably my, my sort of weakness in terms of, you know, I followed George, John, and Paul's careers much mm. more than Ringo's. So I had really never listened to Sentimental Journey all the way through. Uh -huh. And I, so I was expecting not to like this because I had heard all this all these years that it's corny. Um, and, you know, it was just, it, you know, just a, a misfire. You know, as I've been listening to this, I think it's really charming. Um, mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. is it Frank Sinatra? Is it Tony Bennett? Is it <laughs> Nat King Cole? No, <laughs> no competition there. Is it That's Bob Dylan? Is it Bob Dylan? <laughs> no. <laughs> but you know what? The, the, the backstory you, you just gave, Ken, I think that is crucial to really understanding and enjoying this album. Uh -huh. This is a tribute to the songs he grew up with. This is a tribute right. to the songs that his mother loved. That, you know, the songs that I'm sure uh, he heard his relatives playing, maybe singing along with, you know. And for, if you know that, listening to the album, I think it's really a charming, you know, fun listen. Um, you know, it's, it's Ringo getting up on stage and singing his favorite songs for, you know, for you. Um, mm. I think the arrangements on the whole are very good. I mean, he... Right wisely chose uh and then i'm sure george martin you know helped him in that you know right. some incredible arrangers and so the the arrangements the the score beautiful you know absolutely beautiful do all the and i'm sure we'll get into this in a second do all the songs work equally well no you know they don't mm -hmm. you know, we'll get into that right. in a second but on the whole, I think, you know, I, I, I think it was just sort of misjudged for the time because, as I'm sure we'll also talk about, many rock stars since have done albums like this and, have, did, not get, and, and did not get the crap that Ringo got in 1970 for doing it. You know, mm -hmm. so I, I think, is, as I said, I think it's a charming listen. Um, and, and it's just, uh, I think a very touching tribute to the songs in addition to rock that he grew up with. Right. And it's important to mention that George Martin did produce this album. Yep. And perhaps what I find most interesting is that every single song has a different arranger for it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know many albums that are like that. Mm -hmm. I must also think that. You're, you're using some of the biggest names in music. Sure, some of them are friends like Klaus Foreman and Paul McCartney and Maurice Gibb was also uh, an arranger, but Elmer Bernstein, someone like that. That must cost some money. He was a know? legend. Yeah, he was yes. a legend. He's one of the great legends of film scores. Mm -hmm. I read you know, somewhere that Ringo actually uh, suggested the idea of trying different uh, yeah. arrangers. Yeah, that was smart. Mm -hmm. Really smart. 
It's his idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But for the most part, the band, the orchestra did their part and then Ringo came in and did his vocals. Right. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like everything was all live with the vocals. Right. So he came in later, sometimes mm -hmm. the same day as the, the backing tracks were done with the orchestra. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Tom, how about you? What are your initial thoughts about Oh, well, if you don't mind, let me, if you don't mind, let me just read this quote here real quick. Um, I wondered what shall I do with my, with my life now that it's all over. I was brought up with all the, those songs, you know, my family used to sing those songs, my mother, my dad, my aunties, my uncles, they were the first musical influences on me. So I went to George Martin and said, let's do an album of standards and to make it interesting We'll have all the arrangements done by different people. And for me, that is the best part about this album. And the most interesting about, thing about this album is that he uses different arrangers on this album. And that being said, once you, once you read that uh, quote, the, the album, I think, you know, makes it more appealing as well. Because let's face it, I mean, newer generations, this type of music isn't going to necessarily appeal to everybody. Mm -hmm. Now, it should probably appeal to more people back in 1970 because you had, a, you know, a, a, an age range of people that were, you know, Ringo's age, and they probably grew up with that stuff just like him. So it doesn't surprise me when you said that that album sold, you know, probably Probably well over 500,000 uh, copies here in the States. Right. So um, so that makes sense. Uh, it makes sense that he does an album like this because, like I read, I mean, this was his big influence on, on him and, and his life. And it makes perfect sense to me that, for him to do an album like this. Um, initially, my, my thoughts, uh, Kit, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of surprised you hadn't listened to this album before. But, mm -hmm. you know, to one notch back behind you i haven't listened to this album since the 90s so it's uh, you know it was um it was nice getting reacquainted with this album um it, it's it's um i don't care for a lot of standards i do like them um it took me a while to to appreciate standards as much as i do now um i think um that i was really started to appreciate standards as i became a fan of classic film of the 30s 40s and 50s and mm. you hear and you heard a lot of those th that type of music in in those songs and like elmer bursting i mean come on i mean his the the, the soundtracks that he did music for ten commandments the magnificent seven to kill a right. mockingbird the great escape Classic says airplane and animal house. I mean, come yeah. on, how can you get any better than that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, <clears throat> say what you will about Quincy Jones. I know some people still can't get over the fact of what he said a few years back, but the man is a talent. Um, He's a legend. He, yep. Yeah, exactly. He is a legend. You He's know, a legend. I just don't like what he said. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I, I understood. I, I, I understand both sides of it. You know, surprisingly, you know, Maurice Gibb and Klaus Foreman, I would never have thought those two to <laughs> be any type of an arranger. Right. Um, but but the songs that they did or arranged for this album are I think are magnificent. And Kit, you touched up on another point too. Um, about, you know, the vocals and the arrangements not necessarily always working for every song. I, mm -hmm. I agree with that. You know, we'll talk about that uh, as well. But for me, I mean, just about every arrangement on this song, on this album is, is top notch. Mm -hmm. Big fan of now, not all the vocals work for me, but that's a different story. But um, arrangement wise, this, this, this album is a knockout for me. Yeah, I can say in my case, I grew up with Frank Sinatra being played mm -hmm. in my household all the right. time. Tony Bennett, all the greats, yeah, Dean Martin, yeah. the Rat yep. Pack, everybody, Bing Crosby. So yeah. for me, this was not some huge adjustment. It was right. a, it was a bit strange for me for Ringo to do a full album of it. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I, I didn't, I wasn't expecting that to happen. But I never had a problem with this. And you know, there. There are not many solo Beatle albums that I'm far away from for any long period of time, <laughs> especially because I do my show every little thing. Right, I exactly. Mix everything anyway. Right. But um, Joe, how about you? Um, well, you know, there's been a quote that's been going around on the internet lately because of the anniversary of <clears throat> John Lennon supposedly calling the album embarrassing, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I don't never remember him saying that. I wouldn't doubt it, but he's most good friends with Ringo. Always seemed to support him in his solo work. It's hard for me to imagine it, though, you know. But okay, John had a weird sense of humor. It's, it's in the Lennon Remembers book. Oh, he said that. Yeah. He said that in Lennon Remembers. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's when he's trying to just debunk everything and uh, you know rain on everything okay so then he did say it it's been a while <laughs> but 
the thing I was going to say is, you know, I can understand that reaction originally. I mean, originally, you know, it took me a long time to get into uh, listening to this album. Um, it, it, I finally did, like everything else. Um, it, it's interesting what we said earlier, Kit said, I think, that, uh, you know, uh, the way it went with Ringo was that you wouldn't, like, expect somebody to do that. And isn't it funny and irony and, and ironic in a while that you think that now it winds up he was the first Ringo? Then he kind of set a trend of doing standards albums. You don't expect yeah. it. Now, yeah. we, you know, since then, everybody, Rod Stewart, Linda Ronstadt, Bob Dylan, who I mentioned earlier, Paul McCartney. Uh, right. It's like, so now Ringo's like uh, kind of like a paved the way for that. He's, he was like the first. At first, it was like a, maybe a little embarrassing. How could a Beatle do this and everything? Now, you look as somebody who really uh, broke new ground in a way, which I think is I just, interesting. I just don't see Ringo getting the credit for it. I don't hear people saying that. Right. I know we say it. <laughs> no, <laughs> and I've been well, it's, it on the radio. it's enough trouble getting people to have credit for any of his new albums, never mind uh, right. an old one. Right. Uh, but I, I have a story. I remember, you know, uh, my grandmother's sister, I guess, I guess my grand aunt, you know, I went to her basement, and I remember when the album came out, or shortly thereafter, and she had it down in the basement, and I, the back cover was there. You know, it's got Ringo, if you could see it, uh, standing there, and mm -hmm. uh, the song titles. And I remember looking at it, thinking, why in Because I, I didn't know what it was. I remember looking at it and saying, why in the world does <laughs> this old lady have a Ringo Starr album? In her basement, now she's you know. listening to it. <laughs> and then, you know, but I started reading the, the tracks. I'm like, oh, these are those old people songs, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> anyway, um, but I've since, for me, I had to grow a, a lot. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I lived with uh, my grandparents and, my, you know, and my mom as well, and sister. Mm. But they always had Perry Como on, Mitch Miller, right. Frank Sinatra, the whole, the whole thing, you know. And my mother was with the 50s. Uh, right. stuff. So I was able to get appreciation from a lot of different music from them. And uh, since then, I've really come to enjoy a lot of that American Standard stuff. So, as I say, it originally didn't really, in my Beatle collecting, listen to it for a long time. Then when I did, I do enjoy the album. I don't think it's a great album, but I enjoy it uh, when you realize, as you say, the reason why he did it. You know, he's doing it for, he said, I did it for me mom or, and dad. <laughs> uh, and uh, he did. He did get influenced by those songs before the rock and roll craze came along. You know, yeah, before he, Gene Autry or whatever he right, was really he, interested in. And uh, I, a lot of what I'm saying, is, is I would agree with Kit and Tom. Um, I like the, the arrangements very much. I think it's a real, uh, you know, a grand album. You know, strong sound as far as the orchestra and everything. In that regard, and you know, I. I'm only saying this because I do enjoy Kisses on the Bottom by Paul, but I think out of the two, Paul's got more of a laid-back feeling with his album. Very. Where, whereas very. Sentimental Journey is a lot more like, uh, you know, brassy and, you know. Big band swing. Big band swing, yeah. old-timey kind of thing. And I like big, I really got into big band music in recent years, too. Mm -hmm. So then the question uh, comes a matter of whether or not Ringo does a good job which we'll talk about different songs. I think on some songs, uh, he's perfectly suited for them. It's almost like he was made to sing a, a, a few of them. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But some of them I didn't think went over as well. And uh, it's not an album that I pull out very often to listen to. Once in a while, I will. Uh, I have to be in the right mood. Even when I was playing it a few times for the show, uh, I was listening to it in the car on CD. And it just was it just wasn't in the right frame, but I played it on vinyl at home uh, mm -hmm. recently. After, you know, after that, and I, it just clicked. It clicked really well. I was just in the right mood for it, and everything sounded so good. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I I kind of enjoyed. It. I think I like most of the songs on it. I can enjoy in, in the context of it. Maybe like I think there's twelve songs. Maybe like you know seven or eight of the twelve. I I really enjoy. And uh, if you want to talk about individual songs later, I'd like to go through them. Yeah. That's okay. my feeling. Just yeah. one, I, I just wanted to drop off one point uh, you made, Joe, which I think is, is really a, a 
you know, a, a crucial one here is, as you said, Paul's approach on Kisses on the Bottom was more subtle. And I felt like, you know, as you listen to this, yeah, Ringo is more of you know, kind of a, a showman. I mean, like if you see yeah. the video for Sentimental Journey, Sentimental. Which, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you Good see point. on YouTube, mm. it was perfect because love he comes out on stage. I love that video. Yep, and it's great. Comes out on stage in front of an audience. He's got the bow tie. He's singing like, that's how I picture him on, <laughs> like throughout the album. That's uh -huh. him. Yep. You know, and, and he's you you can envision him, you know, leading the audience in, in sing alongs, you know, almost like a music hall kind of kind of entertainer. That's how and I and I'm charm. not saying, Yeah, and charm. Like and you that, said, charming. And, and, and yeah, and I'm and I'm not, you know, saying that to put him down or anything. I mean, I just hmm. you know, that's how I picture, you know, that's completely different from Paul's approach on Kisses yeah. on the Bottom. Yeah. 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 As opposed to the live kisses concert, <coughs> where right. he's sitting down, very relaxed and very giving. intimate. Yeah. yeah, and the live kisses. Well, well, that's for another show. But for the live kisses, I actually I think I enjoy the performance, vocal performance, more than the album. Actually, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's yeah. it's more intimate when you're watching him sing. Mm -hmm. You know, and also his reaction to singing the music and how it affects him too. Mm -hmm. That all plays a part too. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I think this is a very important thing to study when it comes to the Beatles, because like I said, it didn't all start with rock and roll. And even uh, if you followed the solo careers of the Beatles, you've got George covering Cole Porter and Hogan yeah. Carmichael. Mm -hmm. um, you know, of course, Paul with Kisses on the Bottom. Even if you go back to the Beatles, you've got them singing in the bus and Magical Mystery Tour and... I've yes. got a lovely bunch of right. coconuts and that yeah. stuff. Or the scene in the pub in the James Paul McCartney yes. uh, TV special where he's singing those kind of songs. is a very big part of their upbringing is hearing that. And even though John Lennon said before all of us there was nothing, I don't believe that when it comes to John because he did like other music before that. I mean, you do know that um, Please Please Me was influenced by the song Please by Bing Crosby. Mm -hmm. And uh, also Paul said in the Kisses on the Bottom booklet that there were a couple of songs from the 1930s that John really liked. So it's not like everything started in the 50s with the Beatles. Right. So, um, yeah. And the funny thing is, you know, we're talking about Ringo being a trendsetter. 99% of the time, whenever an artist does something like that, they don't intend for it to be that way. Ringo was just going with what he felt like doing in the moment. And it just so happens that Harry Nilsson did an album just like it a few years later, which was yep. fantastic. <laughs> I, uh, Linda Ronstadt was amazing with yes. her albums. Mm -hmm. Rod Stewart had a lot of commercial success. And then Paul also had success. Right. So, you know, it's one thing. There are artists in rock who have taken individual songs and had hits with them, but not do a whole album like this like the Four Seasons did, I've Got You Under My Skin. Great arrangement. You know, Billy Stewart did Summertime, the George Gershwin song. You know, but to do something like this was pretty radical. You know, I'm only now starting to think that in 1970, what a groundbreaking year overall. For, for Ringo to come out with an album like this and an album of country music, yeah. you would never expect him to start his career off like that. Right. Well, okay. country wise, I, I mean, he established himself as as a country fan in in his Beatle days. I would no, but yeah, you wouldn't expect him to do a whole country album. You, Fair you enough. Probably yeah. would expect the pop yeah. rock album from him. Mm -hmm. And likewise, Paul's approach to do, for the most part, uh, you know, uh, do it yourself kind of an album at home was yeah. very radically different. For mm -hmm. for John to do Plastic on a Band, that album was so completely different. Although he was doing a lot of raw you know, energetic songs like that. And uh, All Things Must Pass blew everybody away. What a year, 1970 <laughs> yeah. it was yeah. overall. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, with Ringo, nobody thinks, hey, I'm going to be the first one to do this. You know, it's just what he felt like doing at the time and look at what that's become. So let's talk about what songs really work for you yes. on mm -hmm. this album. Um, right. Go back to Kit. 
Oh, gosh. Okay. Well, there were a number <laughs> that, that um, really charmed me. I thought Whispering Grass. I thought, oh, yeah. that, and uh, there are a couple of viewers here who have mentioned that as well. Uh, I thought that suited him very well. Um, I think the, um, you know, again, it, you know, I hate to keep saying charming, but I mean, it, it really was. Um, it was, you know, the, the range perfectly suited him. I liked his uh, his delivery. I I thought, um, you know, he almost made it sound of, reminded me a little bit of, of Good Night in terms of delivering it almost like a children's, you know, song. It really wasn't, mm. you know necessarily but the way he delivered it um and it was uh found out first recorded in 1940 by the ink spots and i right. i'd never yep. heard this before yep. uh number of songs on here i did know uh but this one um i uh, i had not and uh i really just thought that was it just suited him um very well love that dream now i love that song to begin with mm -hmm. uh that's one of my favorites um and uh beautifully arranged by George Martin. I thought that was uh, just, uh, you know, wonderful producing, um, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, wonderful mix, just, just, you know, couched around his voice. I thought, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that's at least double tracking Ringo's voice, which I thought was yeah, nicely, like yeah, yeah, nicely done because um, I think that was originally uh, recorded by uh, the Pied Pipers and many other uh, vocal uh -huh. groups. And so doing kind of a similar effect with Ringo, not exactly harmonizing, but, but kind of creating a similar like group effect. That's very clever. I, I thought that that was well done. And again, not too rangy for him. Um, and yeah. uh, I just, I, I love that. I, I thought that was, uh, Love is a Many Splendor Thing. Now, I have to say, I'm not a big fan of that song. I've never particularly liked it. Mm. But I liked Quincy Jones's arrangement. And, and I think I've mentioned this before big Quincy Jones fan here so that's that's my bias but <laughs> I liked his arrangement I thought it was a little hipper um and and a little different uh so I I did like that so while I don't love the song I do like the arrangement and again it, it kind of suited Ringo I thought it was uh you know a, a way that he could handle it and it didn't sound too you know it, it didn't stretch him too, you know, too much. Sentimental Journey, I thought that was great. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, it it, it suited him. Um, it, it, made, it was a little more, um, I don't know, uh, a little more whimsical maybe. Uh, I mean, Doris Day's version, which is my favorite, um, you know, that's a little more wistful. And, and, and his was a little more, again, like I said with the video, kind of a in a way and kind of a uh, nostalgic um night and day i thought that worked fairly well uh, mm -hmm. and, I, and i love night and day that's that's uh, one of my favorite cole porter songs um and uh beautifully beautifully arranged bye bye blackbird but i mean kudos to morris gibb on that i right. i thought what a great job uh they did and it almost had a music hall quality to it old george formby uh kind of feel to it with the ukulele um right. i mean i could absolutely picture ringo um you know leading a sing-along um on that and that's yeah. such a such a catchy song anyway um and uh and it just added to it and and uh you know again it just suited ringo very well so those are were my favorites where i thought you know that they really worked for ringo's personality um and um and again wonderful arrangements beautifully played nicely produced great choices there mm -hmm. and also very interesting that richard perry you know, the start of his relationship mm -hmm. with Ringo really goes back to this album because mm -hmm. he did the arrangement mm -hmm. for the title track, The Sentimental Journey. And mm -hmm. I thought that was wonderfully arranged. Yes. You know, great. You know, how do you feel about people who will say that, you know, Ringo, you know, you, you did talk about this before, but because he has a limited range, maybe he shouldn't be doing something like this. I kind of feel like the way that these songs were structured, it didn't require you know, that big range and it was right. really suitable for him right. with these mm -hmm. arrangements. Did you feel yeah, that I, way, Kit? Or, or Tom? Well, I, yeah, no, I mean, Kit. Oh, oh, no, I'm sorry. No, I just felt like, okay, the one mis big misstep was uh, Stardust. 
I that agree. Was, <laughs> yeah, that was a huge misstep. I mean, that is a very hard song to sing. It's got a very weird melody, and and I'm sorry. Yeah, that one stabbed me in the heart because that's that's, yeah. a, that's poetry. You know, that should be light as air. I mean, Nat King Cole was the one who nailed it. I mean, that is that is just a, a lighter than air poetic kind of thing and Ringo oh my god <laughs> I'm so <laughs> sorry to, dis to disagree with Jeff Kendall because much earlier in the program he said uh, Stardust and uh, he also liked uh, very much uh, Have I Told You Lately That I Love You and those are my two least favorite or worst on the, on the know, album you know too. about <laughs> about Stardust you know my, my girlfriend is, is, is a singer and she's always you know analyzing vocals and we were listening to Stardust in, in the in the car and I wrote I made sure I wrote it down how she said it because this I mean she gets technical she's like Ringo tends to sing on the second part of the diphthong instead of holding the first part till the end <laughs> I have no idea what that means, but all <laughs> I know, I said I got to write that when we do the show. But I didn't like, I didn't like his vocal too much on that, uh, or um, and have well, I, you nobody asked me. But <laughs> a segue in, and have I told you lately that I love you? I mean, that's a, a, the other one. I mean, I don't know. They got silly bird sounds and these pauses, dramatic pauses and flourishes and lovey dovey. Da -da 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 I, I can't stand that song. It was a little but, corny. But, yeah, it was uh, a little corny. Yeah. Mm, but huh. it was when on Stardust, it was when Ringo was doing those heavy drums, which, no, not on Stardust. <laughs> and then was like, ah, oh, hit me. And I'm like. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 I think I out loud that. I said, oh, <laughs> yeah. no. <laughs> uh, actually, I do have favorites, too. You know. Stardust is one of my favorites on the album. I thought it was wonderfully <laughs> arranged. I really did. <laughs> I really do feel I that way. I was going to do a spit take. <laughs> <laughs> I was almost going to really do a big one, but I just did a little one. <laughs> I think it's the perfect arrangement. I think Ringo oh. sings it really well. <laughs> oh, man. I and truly thought he was going to do a spit take. That is so funny. I did, but it was a little one. but not <laughs> a big one. <laughs> Just for fun. All right. Oh, that's funny. Okay. <laughs> But well, that shut up that now. You, that's that's one of my favorite parts of the song when he goes, mm. "Ah, hit me!" You know, <laughs> yeah, and then you hear, you hear the orchestra come in, and that's not Ringo on drums, in case anybody. <clears throat> he doesn't right. do any drumming on the album. No, yeah. oh, no, I no. Thought, he doesn't oh, I drum. It was okay. Yeah. My bad. Uh, no. On the entire album, he does not. Yeah, drum. didn't didn't what? Quincy Jones kind of make something like that clear when he was being uh, derogatory towards Ringo? Something like that. I don't remember the story, but uh, something about Ringo's drums. Yeah. Anyway, anyway uh, yeah, I don't but, remember. But, but uh, but I'm gonna I have to recover because I do <laughs> agree with Kit that he did a fantastic job on Love Is a Many Splendor thing. Okay, that's a favorite, Tom. Yep. Oh, Tom. Tom, <laughs> Tom is shaking his head. Listen, there's there's a reason why the backing vocals are up really high for that song because his <laughs> vocals are not that good on oh. that song. Well, okay, Quincy Jones did a good job. <laughs> yeah, well, that's one of the ones. The, the, the six songs that I have are, are favorites um, are the ones that work for me vocally and arrangement wise the best. Uh, but you know, again, that's just my my opinions. But but Kit mentioned you know, night and day, uh, great jazzy feeling with that, and it's got a great set, great uh, sax solo there towards the end, which I think is really good. You know, bye bye Blackbird, I I love that. What, what is that? A, a it's not a banjo. What was that? A, a ukulele at the at the beginning of that? I think it was. Song? I think it was a ukulele. I'm okay. not sure. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, yeah. But uh, that's good. I mean, good vocals from, from Ringo on that one, too. Um, I'm a Fool to Care uh, with Billy Preston on that. I think that's a great uh, great one with uh, another nice sax solo on that one. And that was the, the one Klaus Vormann um, arranged. Uh, Blue Turning Gray Over You, I think, is, is, a, is an excellent song as well. And I think that worked with uh, Ringo's uh, vocals. Uh, Dream Kit, you mentioned that. I, I like it because his he's 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 got that soft vocal from Paul, you know. I mean, not Paul, but Ringo throughout that song, and I think that that style of, of vocal from him works for a couple of these songs on on this album. And uh, and then you know, I I do enjoy "Have I Told You Lately That I Love You." I think it's a nice up tempo song. Um, I'm a big fan of Elmer um, Elmer Bernstein, and mainly because of his you know scores that he's done for for so many movies. But I think it it's a, a great uh, thing. Um, it's it's funny too to, to to say. I mean, none of these 
songs were composed while Ringo was there. I think weren't, weren't all these songs um, arranged uh, elsewhere? I mean, probably the one with oh, George yeah. Martin and, and Paul. But um, but I think the one with Quincy Jones wasn't that arranged and sent to him, or even the one uh, Sentimental Journey, um, because that was uh, arranged in New York, I believe. So he, he did the vocals right, so, late, yeah. later later from England, yeah, I think. Right, mm -hmm. right. So I don't know. Yeah. I don't think uh, all of these songs were arranged, um, you know, in the same. Uh, studios that that Ringo was was singing the, in them in as well. I'm not 100 percent sure on that, mm -hmm. but uh, it's also interesting to note that he was also working on it. Doesn't come it don't come easy uh, during those right. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. As well. Right, right. You know? Yeah. Uh, so Tom Brennan says the, a banjo opens up by by yeah, Black banjo. Okay. Yeah, that's, oh, okay. yeah, and that's what I wrote. So it was Sorry cool that's that. a banjo. So I, I was okay. I was right, glad I was right on that. <laughs> okay. But, well, uh, yeah. That. Yeah. It is kind of interesting about it. Don't come easy. I mean, you would think that maybe he'd release that as a single in 1970, right. but he had the two albums. Yeah. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and he he hadn't recorded early 1970 yet as a B side. So, right. but um, but what, I do well, want to get a chance to say what I did like because I've been criticizing yeah. those couple of songs. <laughs> oh, okay. so if I may, uh, I, I I Sentimental Journey title track really love that love that version by Ringo and it, and it's enhanced by the video as I said. I've, he did it at Talk of the Town, the place yeah, uh, right. that recorded it. Bye bye Blackbird, absolutely love that version. It, it, it uh, it's upbeat, fun, zippy, lighthearted. It just yep. I I really have a good time with it. I didn't know for a long time that Morris Skib of the Bee Gees arranged it. It was yeah. good to know. Yeah. Uh, again, I, I enjoy that that kind of uh, style of it more than than the Paul version. And this is not a, not a let's knock Paul thing. I just was comparing them uh, for a long time when I when I heard Paul's version. Uh, Night and day, I like that. Cole Porter song. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good version. Whispering Grass, which I think, uh, and a Klaus Vorman did uh, I'm a Fool to Care, didn't he? Which yeah, one? yeah, he did mm -hmm. Fool to Care. Fool yep. to Care. Yeah. Blue Turning Gray Over You, I agree, Tom. That I think that suits Ringo very well. And I agree with you all, also that, uh, or was it, or, uh, you always hurt the one you love and Dream. Mm -hmm. are, those of, those, especially Dream, is very yeah. good for Ringo. It's perfect. It's like perfect for Ringo. Um, I don't know if you said you always hurt the one you love, Tom, or Blue Turning Gray over you, no. but whatever. I, I think you always hurt the one you love and Dream. Those two are perfect for Ringo. Uh, so off this, and uh, that's that's a lot of songs, really. When you it think sure of it, is. yeah. That yeah. I, that I you know enjoy on there. Just had a problem with those two. Start you know I, I'm not wild about let the rest of the world go by. This the song that closes it. Yeah. Um. Yeah, but um, overall, I, I enjoy way more on on the album than not, you know. So, mm -hmm. and when you're in the mood, as I said, when I'm in the mood, I can just hear the whole thing and enjoy it, even with the spots that I might deem a little bit patchy. Mm -hmm. So, right, well, right, fun. Well, I'm glad you gave it such a really good positive review. Mm -hmm. I happen to like most of it myself, mm -hmm. but um, sentimental journey, perfect arrangement. I wouldn't touch that, you know. It just works so well for Ringo. I really think. In the entire album, he, he really doesn't strain in his vocals. I think every song kind of works for him. Um, and I also don't mind when his vocals are mixed with background singers, even at an equal level, because there are times like on Good Night from the Beatles, it mm -hmm. worked for that particular song. You know, and I can hear Ringo's vocals in the song anyway, and they were fine. Mm -hmm. No one's going to say that Ringo is the greatest singer of all time, but he oh, can sing well, right. and he sings these songs well. He has a limited right. range, as we know, and um, he has a, a very warm character voice. And if you're used to it, you know, it's very easy to enjoy mm -hmm. an album like this. Um, Night and Day, killer arrangement. I think yeah. Tommy yeah. brought up the sax yeah. solo. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. killer in that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Whispering Grass is one of my favorites. Um, yeah, and I like the softer delivery of mm -hmm. Ringo's vocals in that particular yes. song. Bye Bye Blackbird is killer. You know, real short, mm. punchy, and, you know, it's... it's I feel so great when I play that on my show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it just it startles a lot of people who have never heard it before. And it's just Makes done. You smile. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm a full care is nice. Um, it doesn't blow me away, but I do like it. Stardust is one of my favorites. It really is. By the way, I don't want to burst any bubbles here. <laughs> uh -oh. but, um, I know uh, Mark Lewison wrote that for Stardust, 
George Martin actually gave EMI an invoice for doing the arrangement for it. So it's kind of in question whether mm. or not Paul actually did the arrangement for this. I have never seen or heard an interview with Ringo or Paul where they talk about this recording. I love the arrangement, but it is possible that it wasn't Paul. Mm. Okay. Yeah, from my understanding, it was him. It was almost kind of almost like the family way type thing, where where Paul just gave a few bars or or ideas, and then George Martin was there to to make those you know or, you know make them realize yeah, for, for yeah. Paul. You know, from my understanding. Well, you know, an arrangement yeah. you've got to score a whole orchestra. Oh, absolutely. And, right. and George Martin's used yeah. to doing that. Yep. So yep. it's it's very possible most of the work came from George Martin. I'm not saying it is, but I, I think we don't know for sure. Correct. Um, Blue Turning Gray Over You is a killer recording yep. right there. Yeah, Louis like Armstrong that. actually did that song <laughs> around 1930. I love the way the song ends. I just lost myself there, child. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, That's fun. <laughs> love is a Many Splinter Thing is one of my favorites there. Mm -hmm. It's another one where Ringo's vocals are balanced with the background singers, and it works. It's actually a very, it's a favorite song of mine that dates back to really the mid-50s because the Four Aces were the group that had a hit with it. It was a number one song in 1955. And um, that song works as it sounds like it could have come out of the 50s. You've, with you've that seen the movie. You've seen the movie, I've haven't you? I've never seen the movie. Oh, I you should check it out. Oh, man, good stuff. Okay. Yeah. I certainly know the song though. From yeah. the four mm -hmm. aces. Dream. I love the arrangement from George Martin. Um, you know, you always heard the one you love. I like that those that's not the one that really sticks out for me. Have I told you lately that I love you is kind of strange. I'm the last person to say anything about music being dated. Remember me. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. But every time every time I hear this arrangement, I'm thinking of watching laughing and going to yes. the party and everybody's like the, da, 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 you know, like that, that is my exact reaction. I, I swear to God, I, I wrote like Austin Powers. <laughs> okay, okay. That works. Yep. But um, it's a good arrangement from Elmer Bernstein. Who's going to argue with Elmer Bernstein? Yeah. Oh, you know, I don't know. I don't know anyone. I don't like that probably, version. Oh, okay. I don't know. I don't know. Other, I don't know what the other one sound. I don't know the. Uh, other, I don't think I know that. So it's no. I know have. I know have. I told you lately that I love you, but. I don't know where I've heard it when I was uh, well. You younger, don't think but... it, you, you well. Don't misinterpret of... it from the uh, you know the Van Morrison Rod Stewart version. Have I told no, you? No, I don't. No, I don't. Yeah. Not from yeah. that. But I know. I know. I mean, I know the tune. You know, I know the. I know it. But uh, I. I wasn't prepared for all those. I don't know. I call them like uh, pauses with, with with flourishes in it, like kind of like music and the the corny birds and like love cues and all that. I just didn't like that. I don't know if that's part of the, the way it was conceived originally and, and done. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I know there have been a lot of versions of that song. And mm. I grew up on Ricky Nelson's version, oh, which actually oh. was a B-side for one of his singles. Well, um, that I think I can like. <laughs> I, um, but I do like Ringo's version of it. And I really like Let's, Let the Rest of the World Go By. That's one of the songs here that I never knew before mm -hmm. until I heard I Ringo's version of it. And it dates all the way back to 1919 when it was written. And it was actually arranged by Les Reed, who um, just recently passed away, by the way. He was a great British songwriter. He wrote a ton of hits for British invasion artists like Petula Clark and Herman's Hermits and Tom Jones, a lot of Tom Jones hits. But um, no, I really like this album. And, you know, I'm so appreciative of the fact that Ringo has now done 20 studio albums. But ever since the Ringo album of 1973, they've all been pop rock albums. And I kind of wish once in a while he would stray from that formula. Um, although the interesting thing for me in following Ringo's more current stuff are all the different songwriters that he's worked with. I think that you grow as an artist when you work with different musicians. So he's grown a lot as a songwriter. And that's what I find most interesting about Ringo's more recent efforts. But I wouldn't mind if he would try this again. Yeah. And I know a lot of people would love it if you would try another country album. Yeah. But yeah, yeah think... for for a while we've been saying that, yeah. 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 But uh, I sure wouldn't mind if if he made another sentimental journey. Um I just have a feeling that, you know, he's very comfortable cranking out these albums and um he likes what he's doing. He likes putting out the pop rock stuff every couple of years and um, you know, I'm <laughs> not going to complain. He's given us so much 
but uh, I like when there's a detour once in a while. Right. Yeah, or something that's refreshing and not. I don't, I don't know if I'd like. Well, I, well, I wouldn't mind him doing a country album for some reason. I wouldn't want him to do another like kind of standards album though. I kind of like just having the one, the first one, you know, the innovator, the one who started it all. You know, in a way, that one album. And uh, why don't we give a shout out to the pub too on for the cover? Ah, uh, yes, the, the Empress. Empress. <laughs> Near the from right around the corner from where Ringo uh, lives, right? Yes, yeah. indeed. Right, right near Grove. the dingle. Right near uh, Admiral <laughs> Grove, around the corner. I have one That's... memory that every now and then I share in my programs, because I went to England one time only, and on a bus trip, we stopped right in front of the Emperor's Pub, so some people went out, took pictures. We only spent a few minutes there, and I'm standing right in front of the Empress, and there's this teenager that's driving by in a bicycle, and he had one of like the, the John Lennon caps that he wore in A Hard Day's Night. Mm. He's driving in front. He sees everybody that's watching the Empress Pub. He looks at me, and he says, Ringo Starr used to live here, mate. So he got up <laughs> And then he took off. <laughs> every time I think of the Empress Pub, that's what I think of. Well, that's a great memory. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, no kidding. <laughs> I also Duh. want to tell you that the woman who became my wife, Joanne, she was a, a Beatle fan from the get-go from 1964 on, and her parents used to always make fun of her, didn't like the Beatles at all. They love big band music. And mm. one day she brought home Sentimental Journey, She's playing it in her bedroom, and her father peeks in, opens the door, and he says, now you hear that? Now that's good music. Oh, that's, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's funny. Oh, that's great. Now, uh, we had a viewer ask earlier, and I do apologize. I, I, the, the, uh, it scrolled up pretty fast, so I, I can't remember who asked it. So uh, if you want to mention, uh, want to identify yourself now, you, you certainly can. But uh, we were asked, uh, so... Which do we prefer, Kisses on the Bottom or Sentimental Journey? They're two different albums. That's kind of how I feel, <laughs> you too. You know, two different approaches. Yeah. yeah. And um, I, I love Kisses on the Bottom. By the way, should point out that... You're kidding. What, one, one, song, <laughs> one song is shared on both albums. I thought oh. it was bye bye. Am I losing my yeah. mind or was it bye bye? Yeah, Black yeah that's what I was saying. Uh, that I kind of like. I think I like Ringo's upbeat version better than yeah. that. But you know, like you say, Ken, they're both very different. And uh, for me, I mean, I enjoy Paul's album too. It just depends uh, again on the, on the mood. You know, that's the great thing. You can have you more in a zippy whole kind of like uh, showman, schmaltzy yeah. kind of thing. You put Ringo's on if you want a little bit more subdued, laid back. Paul's. Yeah, if someone's putting a gun to my head and said I had to pick one of them to listen to, I'd probably pick Kisses on the Bottom. Mm -hmm. That's what it would take. Yes. <laughs> yeah, <they wouldn't... laughs> well, I mean, the guy wanted. I guy asked the question. You know, I wanted okay. to give him a straightforward answer. You know. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, it's yeah. George Crinkle. Thank you, George. Okay. <laughs> I might Thank give. The, I might give the edge. This is we're doing that. I might give the edge, very sh sh small edge, to uh, Sentimental Journey. Okay. I I would have to agree. You know, I I think I mean very slight edge. Uh, it's a tough yeah. call because because Paul, I mean, boy, did he surround himself with some. I mean, Diana Krall, oh Diana sure, Torelli, yeah. I mean, yeah, oh my God, I mean, uh, that's just a, you know wonderful, wonderful people. Um, but I kind of I. You know, I kind of like Ringo's approach. You know, the 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 kind of a little more. I don't know if in your face is the way I want to put it, but a little more of that bold big band yeah. kind of approach. And, and boy, the arrangements on this are just top shelf. They really mm. are. Yeah. Um, and so I, you know, I, I guess I would give a very slight edge to sentimental journey. Very slight. Uh, mm. I can't mm -hmm. pick. <laughs> yeah, really, I know they're they are different. You're right. They're very different. Oh yeah, it's not. And it's not. When I say it, it, it's not that big a gap. Like I wouldn't say, oh, by you know leaps and bounds. I, I like them both. Uh, so no, about but, the same. But Ringo's maybe a little more. Yeah. Sentimental Journey has more of a big band feel yeah. to yeah. it. Yeah, absolutely. And Kisses on the Bottom is more like you're going into a jazz club and you're seeing some yeah. classy trio. Yeah. Even though there is there's orchestration too. Yeah. But you know it's a very different feel. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Um, yeah. And that's yeah. why I think with, well, with both of those albums, um, for me personally, 
uh, kick because because you had mentioned you know listening to the original versions. I think both these albums work better if you're not familiar with those original cover or original uh, versions. Mm. Um, you know because it's because you know like we said, I mean Ringo's voice he's he's got limitations. He does sing these songs well, but does he sing them as well like you said Nat King Cole or or the others that that originally sang these songs? I mean who's to say? But um, but I think they do work a little bit better if you're not familiar with those songs. Mm-hmm. I hate to tell well, you, I don't think not, uh, that Paul sings sings as good as Nat King Cole on on the Kisses on the Bottom. But that's no, only sir. because I think, I uh, you know he's older and uh, yeah. it works better. His voice works better for some of those songs, I think, than others. And I really wondered, oh man. What took you so long, Paul, to do this American <laughs> yeah. Stewart. Rod Stewart. Rod Stewart. Yeah. That's what. Rod Stewart. Yeah. You know? yeah. I Absolutely. think Paul, I don't think Paul wanted to be looked at as cashing in. Right. And, yeah. and you know, on the latest trend. Mm-hmm. But um, I think Paul wanted to, to give a more gentler approach to it. Um, when he's doing his natural voice and he's projecting more on a song like Get Yourself Another Fool, mm-hmm. you know, or uh, on my Valentine, or only our hearts. Those songs. Um, his voice is strong, but mm-hmm. he wanted to give a gentler delivery. You mm-hmm. know what he called a littler voice. Some mm-hmm. people might think that's because he can't handle uh, <laughs> those songs, but I think that's what he really wanted to do at that moment. Because right. if, if he could do those other songs that way, he could have applied that same approach with some of those other songs. Yeah. But he chose not to do that. So I wish, I wish Paul would do another Kisses on the Bottom. I really do. Yeah. You know, and I, I think when you're brought up on songs, certain arrangements from the very beginning, you become very attached to those particular ones. Yeah. And then what you hear later on doesn't measure up to it. That's, right. that's a natural thing because, you, you know, how you're brought up at an early yeah. age, you hear songs a certain way, you're used to certain arrangements, you cling on to those versions, and then you might like other ones that come along of the same song, but it's never quite as good. Right. So that's how it is for everything, really. That's a good question by Tim here. Yeah. Was this the first gold album by a solo Beatle? Well, studio album? Yeah, studio on, album. Do you, do you count Wonderwall music and electronic sound? If, if it's just got George tell, Harrison's tell name on it, yes. <laughs> Tell me, electronic sound wasn't was gold. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean those those are studio albums. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. No, they are. You know, right. and I, I, and the John and Yoko experimental stuff. Some people yeah. don't consider yeah. those really albums. It depends on how you look at it. Yeah, those but there's albums? no chance that those albums were going to sell. You know, be gold no. or, or platinum, in my opinion. Um, yeah, I mean, but, I could see Wonderwall, Wonderwall having a chance to be gold. I'm not. I don't sure where the where the sales went for that, but uh, yeah. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised if if Sentimental Journey was the first gold solo album. Okay, I'd have to check on Light Peace yeah. in Toronto. Yeah, there's a possibility oh, yeah. that, that that's was. possible. Right. Yep. Yeah, that's true. That true. went top ten. Yep, and, very true. Um, yeah, but you shouldn't base what's the first solo album on what sold well. No, I'm really? not. No, no, I'm no. Just saying that was an interesting question. Yeah, no. I'm just yeah. asking in general yeah. for a yeah. factoid. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. just it's a just, factoid. There are some people who no. think that for it to be a legitimate album, it's got to be a pop rock album. So some mm-hmm. people don't look at "Sentimental Journey" and "Blue of Blues" as being real albums. In mm-hmm. fact, Ringo himself. I was going to say, I'm I looking said, at you, Mr. Starkey. <laughs> you know, and I wish he wouldn't think that way because there was a lot of effort put behind this album. You got all these different arrangers, George Martin producing it. You yep. know, he wouldn't have done it if he didn't really have the heart to do it. And he did love these songs. So mm-hmm. I think it's a legitimate album. Mm-hmm. Oh, so, yeah. So, um, Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, all- yep. And Steve uh, Sanderson points out, which is true. Yeah. Carly Simon uh, did an album, My Romance, which is a great album. I, I, mm. I have that. And that James Taylor just, just came out with one a few weeks ago, which I, which I have to pick up. I keep meaning yeah. to do that. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, the, the tradition continues. And, and uh, yeah, I think Ringo was really a groundbreaker in, in this. Yeah. Good. And, you know, the same thing happened. I told that story about my, my grandmother's sister, my aunt. Uh, my ex-mother-in-law, uh, she's an older woman, and she was into Rod Stewart because of the standard stuff that he was doing. I mean, she I wasn't listening to Hot Legs, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, do you sure. Do think I'm sexy? But uh, she was listening to that. 
Yep. And that's a good thing because younger generations can find out about the original versions of these songs and investigate them. Mm-hmm. Just like the Beatles covered all the songs they did and people went and investigated all the, the early rockers because the yep. Beatles covered them. Mm-hmm. So it's because of artists like these that, uh, that that's happened. And you've always had certain people, young artists today, like uh, Michael Buble, for example, mm-hmm who is known for doing this kind of stuff. Harry mm-hmm. Connick Jr. was doing that for a while. Yeah. Yeah. But um, when you've got established rock stars doing it, that carries some weight to it. So I think a lot of their already built an audience is going to be curious and they'll check that out. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, it's, it's an amazing thing. You're not going to hear Ringo pound his chest and say, I was the first one to do this. But it's just what he felt no. like doing at the time. I could see him, I could see him doing that in, <laughs> in jest, I mean. You know, yeah. I was the first. Yeah. <laughs> but I was the first. Yeah. But I, I wish he he'd was. give himself some credit, you know. Yeah. He really it. Oh, yeah. Hmm. All right. This has been a great conversation. Yeah. Why don't we go around the table here? our virtual table of sorts <laughs> and give each other some contact information for each of us and let us know what uh, we're all up to. Let's start with Joe. Thanks. Cause I have the least. So it's not as, not as embarrassing. <laughs> we'll finally get to me. <laughs> There's no, I'm up to nothing. All you got to do is go to YouTube <laughs> and subscribe to me and Mr. Mayo and wait for me to do a Beatles or solo Beatles related video because uh, I haven't done one in a while because lately I've been all swamped with trying to find toilet paper and face masks and <laughs> vitamin C and all this stuff and I've made a little vignettes about that just for, for laughs but uh, yeah check it out and you know you can always comment over there and sometimes I do live chats if you hit the notification button and we can have discussions just like this and do live stuff alright so that's me done yeah. By the way, I'm just reading a comment here from Jerry Barajas. Barajas. George loved the old big band music, would have loved the standards album from George. Mm-hmm. I was just reminded of in Shanghai Surprise when he oh, did yeah. Hottest Gong in Town. Oh, yeah, that's right. Baltimore that Oriole. How about Baltimore Oriole? Is that close? Oh, that's Hoagie yeah. Carmichael. Hoagie yeah. Carmichael. Yeah. You know, yeah. classic stuff. 30s, 40s music. But uh, yeah. Very good comment, Jerry. Uh, Tom, what have you been up to? Oh, my God. We're uh, crazy over at the Two Legs. Uh, we're pretty much weekly-ish now. Um, we've, we've both got a few uh, more minutes uh, of, our, of our weeks on our hands now, so we're spending it doing more episodes. Uh, we just did a, uh, posted our episode with uh, Ken Michaels' co-host, Darren DeVivo, where we talk about the first three wings uh, uh, singles. I uh, had a good time with that. Um, coming up, uh, we got part two of our interview with uh, Ted Montgomery, who just uh, you know released his book right here, uh, the Paul McCartney catalog, which uh, I know Ken Michaels, you uh, interviewed him as well, sure. and, uh, and that was good. Uh, we've got uh, Kenneth Womack coming up next week. We're going to talk to him about the 80s collaboration with McCartney and George Martin, and then later this month, we're going to have Chip Mattinger and hopefully Mark Easter as well, and we're going to talk about the Eight Arms to Hold You uh, book, and then obviously it's going to be more Paul centric. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, but you can get a hold of us at uh, t- uh, Two Legs uh, Podcast at gmail.com. We're on YouTube, pop, uh, Two Legs Podcast, so check us out there and please subscribe to that uh, Podbean, iHeartRadio, and iTunes, and uh, Twitter and Instagram at Two Legs Podcast. Thank you, everybody. Very good. Boy, Chip Mattinger and Mark Easter, you got to get them to update. <laughs> yeah, they got to update. Eight Arms Told You. So there's a yeah. lot of really good McCartney books Absolutely. that are covering his entire career. Absolutely. Okay, Kit, how about you? Well, um, I have uh, the second part of uh, the show, uh, a, a friend of our show, uh, When They Was Fab. Uh, I was on uh, with uh, Anthony Rotuno. Um, we uh, talked with Ed Chen, uh, the second part, about uh, the Beatles as actors which was really interesting to do and what kind of projects uh, they might have done other than Hard Day's Night and Help and we talked about things like you know Up Against It and Lord of the Rings and you know we had a really fun conversation uh, so uh, go check it out on their uh, When They Was Fab um, uh, 
Facebook page. It's up there. It's on Podbean. So uh, do check that out. Um, and I'm hoping to get back uh, to writing soon and all because uh, my mother's coming home from rehab this week. She's, uh, <laughs> yeah, she's finally coming home. So uh, so I will be hopefully getting back to she a more regular <laughs> <home. laughs> Yeah, that's right. So very, very good, very good, Tom. And so, Sorry. oh yeah, I know you had to do it. You had to do it. Yeah. So, uh, so that will be. Uh, so hopefully, I will be resuming my regular writing schedule very soon. And and thank you everybody who's been uh, so nice writing, uh, you know, writing me messages and and posting you know, wonderful stuff on uh, Facebook. Really appreciate your support during uh during this crazy uh time and and you know really want to thank you for it so as always uh just uh follow me on facebook and uh, you can check out my website at kiddotool.com and on twitter at kiddotool and uh as soon as i have new stuff up uh i will let you know okay all right uh, cool some more comments okay. here jeremy potorala writes in no single from this album sentimental journey or the mccartney album at least weeks later. Very interesting about that. Well, you know? but, both of yes. them, but both of them had promotional videos. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. What, would it, what would have been the yeah. s- single? Should it have been Sentimental? How about Bye Bye Blackbird as a single? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I could it's see really Sentimental. Weird. I yeah. mean, I don't know if they would have done that well, but certainly deserved to release mm-hmm. some single from Sentimental Journey. We've always questioned about the McCartney album why Maybe I'm Amazed wasn't a single initially and you have to wonder if it was because of the competition with instant current right. at the time and and the let it be album coming out i don't know will we ever get the answers to this i don't know i don't know do they yeah. does anybody know the answer to it mm-hmm. i don't know <laughs> all right as far as me uh i also did an interview with ted montgomery the author of the Paul McCartney catalog. And you can find that on my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. Go to interviews page four. It's split up in two parts. One is Ted and I talking about Paul in the 70s and then Paul in the 80s. Notice how I left it so that he has to come back so we can do more. <laughs> more <yeah. laughs> he got it. I'm very sneaky that way. Anyway, so if you want to hear that interview, you can find that on my website. Don't forget my Beatles trivia and games page where you can win one of nine prizes, including Ted Montgomery's book and also Kid O'Toole's book, Songs Who Were Singing, and so many other great prizes. As far as things we said today, we did a show last week, uh, which has gone out. It's about solo Beatles disappointments. So Darren DeVivo, Alan Cozen, and myself talked about certain instances throughout the Beatles solo careers that we were disappointed about maybe certain albums or tours or whatever and you can find that on YouTube also on Podbeam and iTunes and uh, we will be recording our next show sometime next week so it'll be going out same avenues iTunes (laughs) Podbeam and YouTube and still no live broadcast of every little thing because the, no. uh, the college campus at uh, New Haven University had shut down. I'm getting are they just going, I are they get going, to do a live show. Are <laughs> they going like month by month on that decision? I mean, are, are they giving you updates and stuff like They're that? They're giving me updates, but until the campus itself is open, they can't do okay. anything. Mm. There's no live broadcast, period. Right. at all there's nobody doing any live shows from their mm-hmm. air studio so it's like that at a lot of radio stations right. some right. of the uh more professional as we say radio stations uh can pay their djs to do their shows from their home <clears throat> which would be kind of nice if i could do that from this studio but um we'll see what happens i mentioned right. to get back but hopefully that will be soon all right back up all your cares and woes <laughs> at, least, at least you're not singing like Tom just did. So, uh, <laughs> I go ball, my cares and woes. I'm never going to be embarrassed to sing on this show now. You no, know please. Bring it on. <laughs> yeah, bring it on. We have no pride here, do we? No, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, just, this, he sang a Yoko sh- song on my channel yeah. for crying out loud. Yeah. You, should, you <laughs> should hear me. Yeah, you should hear me singing Olivia Newton-John songs on the, on the way to work uh, every morning. That's not pretty. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice album, by the way, that you got. I saw the album. 
Oh yeah, I just picked up her first album. Um, uh, uh, if not for you, uh, oh, where oh, she yeah. covers uh, covers the song. If there not you for go. you, go, George Harrison. Right. She also that's related. related. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was her second album. What is life and uh, behind right. that back door? Yeah, she mm-hmm. must have been a fan behind of all things but pass. Oh you yeah, know, absolutely. That, yeah. yeah. Thing uh, you'd like to see? Just give us a holler. All right. Perils nope. of live broadcasting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you guys are experiencing Sorry. it at home. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> so before we go, I just want to say that um, you know, ever since this pandemic has hit us, uh, our lives have been turned upside down, and uh, I just want to say how much it means to all of us that you're watching the show or listening. And um, now more than ever, with social media, we have become a community. We really have. Mm-hmm, we've, yes. all be, we've all relied yeah. on each other. I've never seen more live streams in my whole life from mm-hmm. friends of mine talking to each other or doing live shows, which is fantastic. Absolutely. You know, yes. uh, we all need this source of comfort. So I just want to thank everyone watching. And please, please be safe. Don't go outside unless you absolutely have to. I okay? have to, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, be safe. Yes. Wah, wah. No. Yeah. <laughs> guy's got it made. Relax and vacation. No, one are time. I got to go outside too. You know, I, I you know, I, I, I'm still oh. going to work as well. Right, right, right. Yeah. Forget okay. about that. Okay. Social distancing. Yep. Absolutely. Remember. Okay. Yep. All right. So, on behalf of Kid O'Toole, me and Mr. Mayo, aka Joe, and Tom Lignati, I'm Ken Michaels. Thanking all of you for watching and listening, and we will see you next time. Be safe. See you next time. (laughs) Bye-bye.